Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pod Friends. My name is Matt Scott. I am the host of Pod Friends, and I'm just so thankful to be here, so thankful that you're listening, and so thankful for this week's interview conversation with none other than, as you know, Wendell Holland, who is the winner of Survivor Ghost Island, who was on Survivor Winners at War, but there's so much more to Wendell beyond Survivor, including just his roles and his spot, his growing role in the HGTV world, um, his work with Beave Unlimited, his work on the Purple Pants podcast, and friendship with Bryce Isaiah, the one and only Purple Pants badass. And there's so much that we dove into in this conversation. I, I, I really don't want to talk too much because I want to give you the chance to dive in and hear from Wendell, but just want to give um, a big shout out to Wendell for making space to not only talk about his life growing up, talk about some of the things he's built and put together, his love of plants, um, but also just for just being so open. And he he mentioned this in the interview, but like this was a safe space for Wendell to kind of share his truth, talk about um, so many aspects of his, his life, um, talk about black representation and his experiences with that um, and navigating that, but also talking about um, his friendship with Bryce, a, 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 a an often unfortunately uncommon friendship that we see between a straight black man and a queer black man. And we get into that. And there are so many things that we touched on. I just want to give a massive shout out to everyone who um, submitted questions for Wendell. A big shout out to Megan the Librarian, to Stephanie, to Felipe, to Josh Green, to John John, to um, John L or John I, I can't tell which I, John I, um, so many other people. Thank you so much for just kind of um, responding with your questions. And I made sure to kind of work them in one way or the other, but just want to thank you all um, for your support in that way and sharing your questions for Wendell. And more broadly, I just want to thank you all for your support throughout this first season of Pod Friends. It's really been incredible. This is the season finale, as I've mentioned, and um, I think this is a really strong note to go out on. But I also just want to give a big shout out to the people who left some reviews here. Um, there's one, um, and you know what? Maybe I won't read the, the interview, the reviews too closely, just because um, I don't want to uh, congratulate myself or the podcast. Or the, you don't need to do that. If you want to check out the reviews, that's great. Um, but I definitely want to give um, a, just a big shout out to everyone who left a review because I've been reading all of them and they've kind of been causing me to tear up a little bit just uh, seeing that this pod friends thing is something that resonates with you, especially because, you know, like a lot of us, you know, you never know if the thing that you'll create will resonate with people or if it will be a thing that they could like react to and respond to. And my favorite thing about pod friends has really been hearing from all of you, not only in terms of the reviews. Um, but also in terms of just Twitter and social media and um, seeing the comments either tagging um, me at Matt Scott GW or the Pod Friends account at Hey Pod Friends or the guest just uh, with all of the love. It's so amazing. And I'm, I'm glad that um, this community is really gravitating to that. But, you know, I, I also just want to give a couple plugs before diving in. Um, I want to encourage folks to, to subscribe to the podcast. You could go to robhaswebsite.com slash podfriends feed. That's robhaswebsite.com slash podfriends feed. And I would encourage that because while this is the season finale of Pod Friends, they're I'm manifesting it just like Wendell manifests some things in this interview. There will be more pod friends to come. Um, stay tuned for that. I'm, I'm sure that there will be more conversations like this, and I'm excited for you to check that out. So definitely subscribe, rate, and leave five stars and leave a review. I definitely want to know what you think. And I love the energy around this podcast. And again, I'm just so thankful, genuinely so thankful and energized by this and by all of you and by the conversation with Wendell. Um, if you want to just suggest future pod friends guests, you could go to the link, one of the links in the bio bit.ly slash pod friends nom. That's bit dot L Y slash pod friends nom as a nomination. And, you know, other than that, I would encourage folks to become patrons of RHAP. There are so many phenomenal aspects of being a patron of RHAP. And actually, 
there was just recently, of course, a live show announced happening in early May in New York City. I will be there. And what's going to be really special about that is that it's just a chance to um, connect with the community and connect with with some of the awesome people that you've heard from on Pod Friends and so many others that we have yet to hear from. And so um, that's one reason because there are discounted tickets, early opportunities to buy those tickets. But even more, um, what's so phenomenal is the community. Um, the patron community. And it's not only the Facebook group and Discord, but patron events, special podcasts. Um, the list goes on and on. There's all of it. And it's the start of the month. So it's the perfect time to subscribe. But, um, you know, I'm again, <laughs> I just want to give you all a big shout out because this is one of the last times that I kind of um, will uh, get to t speak to the audience uh, in this way other than my outro. Um, just to thank you for, and, and really to thank Rob Sesternino and the RHAP team who, I won't go through naming everyone, but you know who you are for um, really making space for my voice. Um, not only for me as someone who, you know, for a long time before being in the class of 20, didn't really know how I would fit in or what my place would be if I would fit into RHAP. Um, but also like as a young black queer person, I'm just so thankful for the opportunity to have these conversations. And, you know, this is a meaningful week for me because uh, March 8th, as I mentioned in my interview with Kirsten, was when my dad passed away. And it's so interesting because in talking with Wendell, another young black man, you know, we talk about our dads and, and I'm just so thankful that, um, to, to kind of maybe have this episode, um, to accomplish a lot of things, but in, in one sense to really honor his memory. Cause I know he'd be really proud of that, but, um, thank you so much everybody for kind of listening to me talk and, uh, putting up with me and without further ado, um, here is the introduction. Here is my guest announcement for Wendell making his way to the podcast hailing from the western suburbs of philadelphia with degrees from morehouse college and penn law he's an entrepreneur a designer and as you know a survivor please welcome from hgtv's hot mess house and hometown takeover discovery plus's beach cabana royale survivor ghost island and winners at war and so much more to come He's a winner in more ways than one, and Manifest is about to become a staple on all of your digital screens. He's the best kept secret in entertainment, the most underrated survivor winner of the new era, and an insanely good human being. Give it up for the founder of Beam Unlimited, the co-creator of Bryce One Presents, and the staple of the Purple Pants podcast, your pod friend and mine, Wendell Holland. When I moisturize my hands, this is going to sound weird. Yeah. I use Vaseline. No. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Okay. Because like, you know, yeah. I work with my hands. Yeah. So um, right now I'm getting ready by properly moisturizing my hands. You got to get the Do cuticles. Uh-huh. And then you get in between and then you use the rest for the rest. And you got to really take care of the, and you know what? Oh, wait. See? Okay. Wait, I have, um, I ha actually, it's funny. I have uh, some. Uh, Avino uh, daily. Mo I'm gonna get my like. See, this is the this is what you really need though for that. Like, it really sticks in there and gets in there. See, so Avino is like that's that's top all, that's, shelf. That's, that's that's top shelf. That's well, rather bougie. Funny. It's funny because my mom said like a month ago. I look, she, we had Avino in the house growing up. I'm just saying, but um, she okay. last month Fancy. she was like. She was like, you know what you need? Because I was like, it's so dry here in DC. She's like, you should get a vino. And I was like, you know what? I'll take your advice for once. So um, I actually did it. Ooh, this is good. This should be, this could be an entire podcast. It um, could, because I just went with the <laughs> with the residuals. I went yeah. down and did the feet too. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't do that while, like, I mean, I could, but that's just like, a, this well. could, this, this could be the whole uh, hour, maybe. <laughs> We'll, re we'll reserve our, um, our our moisturizing content. Got to get the moisture in for the next one. But this is the yes. one with the, with the cocoa butter. Oh, my God. See, look, I have some sort – look, we're not – I, I was going to say, do I go get my cocoa butter? Oh my. I have some cocoa butter spray, some oil. Ooh. Ooh, just put that on. Glistening. That's what's all So about. 
if, yeah. we're, if we're going down that rabbit hole, my my um, routine after I shower, mm -hmm. and it might be backwards, but this is just what I do. I use yeah. the cocoa butter body oil, yeah, and moisturize, and mm -hmm. then I use some like shea butter. Uh, I think it's called African black soap. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Lotion, and mm -hmm. I go over the oil with that. So I'm. Um, you know, so you I lock really, in the moisture. That's what I was gonna say. You have to lock in the moisture. Too. That's right. Look, you know. I don't have this. It, not the same exact, part, but I do that too. Look at that. Look at us. We gotta, like, we gotta preserve it. You know, care, taking care of it, you shining. Know? You know, that's why you look like you're uh, 16, do <laughs> except for the beard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised with some of these high school yeah. kids, though, man. Like, I know these youngins have beards, especially in Philly, yeah. man. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was gonna say even in DC. Okay, I used right. to volunteer with. Actually, I still volunteer sometimes. It's I guess it's been a while since I've been like in person volunteering with like the DC high schoolers. But like they for a while, um, I got confused for one. Like they thought I was sixteen. Um, they were like, "What class are you?" In? Still, I'll go. I'll I'll be around them, and they're like, "Oh, which school do you go to?" I'm like, mm, "I did that was me like twelve. Uh, I'm th almost thirty now, so like." It, it's been a minute. It's been a minute since I was in high school. You could pass for a, a real youngin. You could pass see, for like college, high school, especially see, with always, the same face. <laughs> see, I'm I was saying. thinking. I was thinking about. I, I've thought about this a little bit. Like, you know, if I need a backup career, maybe I could be on like the Disney Channel or something like that. You know, maybe I could have my own show. You know, have a second career in my thirties. Because you know, back in the day, they used to have like all of those actors who are actually like fifty, but they're playing high schoolers. Yep, that could be me but, one day. Don't they still do that in Euphoria? Probably. I don't, that, but I don't I, know either. But I heard about it. Yeah. Yeah, we should do a, a Euphoria podcast because neither of us watch it. So um, maybe that would we work. could just do all hearsay, like things that's that literally it. That's it. I Let's heard it's it. a good show. That's about it. I heard it. It can push Actually, people heard either way, and two. it might be a little mm. disturbing. And <laughs> these are high school kids. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being old. I don't Look. know. Maybe I need to keep watching. I've watched maybe like three episodes of season one. I'm trying to get through it. I don't want you to get canceled at the start of this interview for um, for any of your TV takes. And like, look, I'm just watching out for you. But like, speak Bless. like there, there's there's so much so much that we could dive into uh, doing this other than our skincare routine, which is a very important thing. You know, um, cocoa. You need to get the cocoa butter oil and lock it in. Um, but I, I'm like, I'm wondering because like you are sitting there. Uh, beautifully surrounded by the light, by these plants. Like, what? Okay, where are you now? What is going on? Why are you basically in like a in an indoor safari? Because that's yes. that's what you're giving right now for those who are watching the YouTube version of of this. Well, I have some of my plants around me. This is my living room. Gets mm -hmm. pretty good light, mm -hmm. um, and because it's the winter here in Philadelphia. Well, I live in the Western suburbs. I live in yeah. Ardmore, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It's the winter here. So I had to bring in a lot of my plants from outside. This is maybe like a quarter or a fifth of my collection, but they're chilling in here, getting some good light, thriving. Um, that's where I am. Ardmore PA. Yeah. Represent. Yeah. Did you discover, uh, did you discover like a love of plants first or of building things? Like where did that even where did the plant thing come from? Because I I didn't like realize that you were as passionate about houseplants as you were, uh, but it's very clear. It's very yeah. clear that you have a strong relationship with many houseplants. So and I got some houseplant books chilling what? from our boy Hilton Carter. Oh my God. Yeah, I love plants. One is yeah. even signed. Uh, I was able what? to meet Hilton. Yeah, I messaged him here and there. Uh, okay. I'm going to... I desire to work with him one day. That's one. Of, that's the first thing we're going to manifest on this Whoa. podcast. Yeah, we're manifesting yeah. it. I'm working work with Hilton Carter one day. Working with Hilton Carter. Shout but, out to Hilton um, Carter. Yeah, he's he's the go. goat, man. He he does awesome things. Very motivating and inspirational with his plant care and the things he posts. Yeah. But um, I, yeah. you asked if I developed my love for building or plant life first. Yeah. And, I grew up since fifth grade in a house with a, a pretty nice sunroom. And my mm -hmm. mom had a lot of plants in there. And mm -hmm. I was always like, mom's kind of the weird plant lady a little bit. <laughs> a little bit like I, I, I don't see it. Like I don't I don't get this this allure, yeah. this plant life. 
Um, shout out to Mom Duke. She's not weird. She's <laughs> loving. She's beautiful. She's the greatest. I was but, gonna uh, say that's good to good to add that into. <laughs> shout out to Mom. Yeah, shout out to Mom. But um, I so I started building at a very young age too. My dad, he um, he worked. He's an attorney. He also had other mm. jobs like in the government and things and on boards and stuff. But he would come home and he would like we'd frame out the basement. We drywall the basement at a young age. I'm talking second, third, fourth grade. I'm helping him out. I'm learning how to use a hammer and nails and screws and the drill. And I started like building little things on my own, even way back then. Um, Mm -hmm. And forts outside and tree houses and just little things. He just let me do it. He let me be imaginative. And so that was a, that creative outlet. I've always needed creative outlets and building was one of them going back. And then actually like painting and other things, um, but that building desire and passion kind of like reignited back in like 2013, 2014, mm-hmm. when I needed a bed for myself and I built my own bed. And yeah. then I was like, all right, I, I got something here. I can actually, I can build. This is a pretty dope bed. If I look at that bed now, I'm like, yeah, that bed sucks. <laughs> but back then I was, I was feeling myself. So um, I'd say that the passion for building was definitely longer than the plant life, um, mm-hmm. the passion for plant life, which actually might have, it might have come on Survivor when I got off the island. Wow. And I started wanting to bring little plants into my apartment. Yeah. Wow. That's really the game of jungle. Wow. That's deep. That's wild. Cause like now that I'm looking at it, now that you put it like that, I'm like, wait, is Wendell out on the island right now? Like, what's happening? Mm-hmm. Is that. You know, you can, I mean, I, you, I could see it. I could see it. But, no, you know, no. like, so you mentioned there's a lot there that you already mentioned. And one thing I'm wondering, because you mentioned the creativity aspect of, of it. Like, is there something that you're most, well, actually, I guess it's like two questions. What was the last thing that you, you built? And then what was like the coolest thing that okay. you built? All right. So. As of late, I've been a little busy. Like I was filming a new HGTV show, Shameless Plug, oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh, it ended maybe like thank you. It ended maybe like yeah. three weeks ago. They were bringing me down to Wilmington, North Carolina, a few times a month for the last like six months, mm-hmm. um, and so I've been a little busy with that. And this is the HGTV is like one of my goals. I'm a goal setter. Mm-hmm. That's like one of those things that I'm like I want it. I want it. Yeah, kind of like Survivor. Yeah. So. Um, building was kind of on the back burner a little bit. I'd come home, me and Joey, Bryce, Chris, we, mm-hmm. we'd come in and build a few things. But for, for, the, for the most part, I was very selective with the pieces I was taking on because I didn't have much time. And I yeah. had to, you know, um, get the energy to be able to be a proper host. So I had mm-hmm. to actually take my downtime and, you know, rejuvenate at home. So the last, but it finished three weeks ago. So- yeah. We were able to do, we had an awesome piece that we delivered to the No Dunks podcast in Atlanta. Um, yeah. There are some really cool dudes that coincidentally happen to be Survivor fans. And okay. they, um, a few years back, I, because I went to Morehouse and I always go to Atlanta, I always go for homecoming despite mm-hmm. COVID and they're not being homecoming. I was yeah. at a, I was in Atlanta with, with my buddies during a homecoming. We decided to go to a Hawks game. Mm -hmm. And I'm just walking around. I got hooked up with some tickets or something. And as I'm leaving, I hear these guys calling me like, Wendell, Wendell. And they rolled up on me. It was the guys from this podcast three, four years ago. I'm like, yo, I recognize you guys. They used to have a a show. And they're like, yeah, we're big Survivor fans. We want to, uh, you know, we want to work with you or interview you one day. So next time I went to Atlanta, I interviewed with them. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to a couple weeks ago. This is now me knowing them two, three years. um, And I delivered a beautiful podcast table for them in Atlanta Mm. and a sign that says no dunks. So yeah, I saw that on Instagram. Yeah. They were working off of a ping pong table and I upgraded them to this beautiful Oak table with, with the steel legs. So that was my last like nice project. There we go. And like, what's the thing that you're kind of, is there a thing that you're proudest of that you've built so far? I feel like, 
I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, get you get you to choose favorites. Yeah. Uh, but is there something that kind of jumps out, even if it wasn't one of the projects that you it, it was it something that you've done with Beeve? Was it before that? Was it the bed? It sounds like it wasn't the bed that you made for yourself back in 2013, 2014. That was the spark though. So, like, yeah. you know, that was like, yeah. So I the bed was great and it started this thing which changed my whole trajectory. But I'd say I'd say there was a really cool bed that we made for a friend's three year old daughter. Mm -hmm. They are um, they're a little fancy, so they wanted their their fancy princess to have a castle of a bed uh -huh. at the tender age of three. Right. So they and and they wanted it to be a bunk bed, uh -huh. and but look like a castle. And they didn't want it for regular twin beds. They wanted it for full size beds. Mm -hmm. So it's a bunk a castle a bunk bed castle for full beds. And we took our time and made that. It came out real nice. This was like maybe like 4 or 5 years ago now. Yeah. But um that was an awesome project that it was difficult for me to wrap my head around it, but I was able to do that for them. And then there was one, well, the things I did on Hot Mess House. Yeah. It, I had to be very creative with that like a table that pulls off the wall that when it's up uh -huh. looks like a picture frame yeah or like a, a a a unit in the like an ottoman that if you flip the top it reveals a race car track for the kids mm -hmm. so we did a lot of really cool creative things on that show also um for tv because you know they yeah. want they want something really cool and creative so all the projects on hot mess house were pretty dope too yeah, yeah. And you know, I think I think it's it's I would encourage anyone to go check that out. I've checked I've checked out Hot Mess House. Um, and I know a lot of people are just fans of it. They I know that some of the people in the RHP community are wondering when it comes back. So that's a whole other conversation uh, for and maybe for another time. I'm assuming no spoilers. Um, but actually, I like one thing I want to just dive into to really like go back with your story is well, one, I think it's really interesting that your father's story, your dad's story and yours, or at least like the things that you've um, gravitated to are so similar. And I know, I don't know exactly where, but I remember you like mentioning either in interviews or maybe it was even on Survivor, but like talking about your dad. And I just think it's so interesting that, you know, you've both had this um, more... I always forget like which is the left and the right side of the brain. So I'm not going to try to be fancy like that, but okay. like there's like the more um, tech, like you have the, the law, the legal side of things, that side of that thing that's drawing you that direction. And then there's the creativity with building. And I kind of want to go back, like where did the even like, where did the, that you mentioned kind of like your, your dad and your mom, but like, as you grew up, like, how did that creativity manifest? Because obviously you, I mean, maybe you were working on some projects with your dad. Um, and but like, what did that look like? Because clearly, uh, it, it was a little bit of a while you were an adult when you started Beeve and co committed mm -hmm. to that career. So mm -hmm. like, yeah, what were you like growing up? And how was that creativity, but also that uh, other side of the brain uh part of part of it? So I think if I'm not mistaken, yeah, I'm sure they'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh -oh. um, I think your left side is your analytical side, your um, and your right brain is your creative side. I think I'll and go with that. Sure, why not? Fifty percent chance. That's right. Yeah, whatever. I may yeah. or may not be wrong. You say it with confidence, and uh -huh. you know maybe they won't check you on it. But mm -hmm. so I've I've juggled both sides. I think I am the more creative type for sure. Um, but you know, I went to law school and, um, Penn law. It's a, it, when I applied, that was like, that was my number one. It was a top 10, it's a top 10 law school. Um, mm -hmm. it took a lot for me to get in there. I did my thing at Morehouse college. Like I was yeah. like very high. I, I, I did my thing. And, uh, so I was able to get into Penn and I had to really lock in and it wasn't the, the easiest of times for me, but mm -hmm. I was able to graduate clerk for judges and have these, these, um, these pretty interesting jobs. But mm -hmm. um, so I definitely have that side to me, but I think growing up, 
my parents a lot, they gave me a lot of freedom to express myself and they never like they never limited me. My dad worked extremely hard. He grew up poor. He mm -hmm. made a, he made um, a great life for himself and his family. And he never showed me or my two sisters any of his failures. Even mm -hmm. now, like he talked back about like, man, I got fired for this from this job or they let me go from this job. I never saw it. My sisters, wow. we never saw it. We just saw my dad doing his thing, killing it, being a superhero, my idol, yeah. right? And I think that kind of shielding us from that or shielding me, his only son, his namesake mm -hmm. from that yeah. made me think like he's, he's killing it. There's, there's nothing he can't do. Um, mm -hmm. So there's nothing I can't do. Yeah. And so with that kind of a childhood and then he was he's, he's like they call him some people call him around here like the black James Bond. He traveled <laughs> the world a lot and stuff. And one of his friends, wow. <laughs> one of his friends. Um, an ambassador from South Africa. Uh -huh. um, she, he said, she sent her son over to stay with my family for like a few weeks. Then um, he sent, I'm sorry. No, no, this is, this is a different family. When I was in seventh grade, um, we had a minute, one of the ministers of like uh transportation or something from Tanzania. I was getting my, my wow. uh, stories confused from Tanzania. He yeah. sent his sons on different occasions to stay with us for the full summer when yeah. I was a little kid. Um, and so my dad, when I was in seventh grade, he sent me over to stay in Tanzania with them for a whole summer. And as a little kid traveling to the continent of Africa, you don't know, you don't know what you're going to get. And out yeah. there, I was just like, it was great because I'm staying with this, um, this very well established, incredible family, this mm -hmm. like dignified, like um, awesome, great family. But then they take me around the country to like the villages where their family lives and stuff. Yeah. And this family was kind of like, they, they were very, um, they were very well esteemed. But they bring mm -hmm. me like to the to little huts, and I'm eating, you know, out of my hands and. And I'd see these these amazing, happy, beautiful people out there that have created like little fences with sticks. And they just they use what they had and they created all this cool wow. stuff. So yeah. I was as an imaginative kid, I was able to go out there and see basically um, these people that made so much from from little from or from mm -hmm. what we think is like is is not a lot of material things. So when I came back home that same summer, I went in my parents' backyard and I was building like these bike trails just with like sticks and wood and, and rope and stuff and Damn. things that I saw in Tanzania. This is a long way of saying like yeah. um, my, my parents, they allowed me to do these things and see the world at a very young age. And they kind of didn't give me any, any limits or encumbrances or they allowed me to think that I could do anything. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think I came back with an even broader world sense and just a desire in me to say that me, this this black boy from Ardmore, I really yeah. can do anything. And there is nothing that will or can stand in my way because I've never learned that things stand in people people's ways like mm -hmm. that. So uh, I attribute I attribute a lot of where I am to how I was raised. Wow, that is deep. And it's powerful too. And I love it because when I think about how I grew up, even, you know, like, and there, there are definitely a lot of similarities in terms of like my dad, for instance, I saw him killing it in so many ways. And he was definitely such a strong role model for me. Um, and it's so powerful. I actually, I have, I will shout it out because this, like, he passed away five years ago, March 8th. So like, this interview and the fact that we're talking about our dads and their influence is like so powerful and meaningful. But I think the thing that's um, one of the things that's been so beautiful in the last five years is that it's given me the appreciation as a young person, like, damn, he gave, my parents gave me so many tools that I still draw on and still am able to kind of leverage in my life. And, you know, something I think about a lot, people talk about like, to they talk about quote unquote toxic positivity, which I think is a thing. Sometimes people are like, yeah. you could do anything you want and they don't um, give the limitations around that. But 
I will say, and it sounds like you're kind of coming from this place too, that like we kind of have realized like, yeah, we can do it. We, there's so much that we could do and there aren't limitations. And one thing I love about your story is that you have um, like, you kind of have, we've both had those realizations. You've had that realization. And then there are all of these things that other people are able to see where they're able to be like, ah, that's what Wendell means. Like, it's not an accident that Wendell goes on to win Survivor or Wendell goes on to, you know, everything with Beave or HGTV, right? And so um, that is like all really powerful. But also I will say I grew up in a household where my parents were like, okay, um, we need, we're going to get somebody to put this thing together. Um, so <laughs> that is not, that is not me. That is not. Oh me. no. When senior, yeah. we were putting whatever it was <laughs> together to this day. Yeah. yeah. But I, um, I think it's like, it's so, oh no, go for it. Totally. I, I was just going to say, yeah, I am known to ramble. I'm known yes. to talk a lot. We love it. Feel free. No, if, if I'm like going on one of my tangents, cause no. like, and this might be why I wasn't good at survivor confessionals. Cause I just keep <laughs> talking and going and going and they can't cut it into the right sound bites that they need. But relate. if I do, yo, let me yeah. know when, yo, shut up. You're doing one of those tangents. Just let me know. And I'll, and I'll, Damn. no, you're great. You're great. No, this right. is perfect. And I think, you know, this kind of leads me to this question because you were um, you were really on this path to doing law and then went in a completely different direction. And I know yeah. there's a little bit of a story to that. But, you know, something um, that I know that people who are listening want to know is like, when did you realize that that was or did you realize that that was the wrong career path for you? Um, and then like kind of how did you make that jump to follow follow your dreams um, and do kind of, I guess, set you out on the path that you're on now? Yeah, great, great question. Um, probably another one of my long answers. I'm going to. Oh, we to love a long answer. Though. This the right. people are here to listen to you. Let's do this. So, Let's do this. Yeah. Um, I got two waters here. Yeah, I, I was going to say you have to have all the drinks. Like. My breakfast shake. So I'm ready yeah. for a long talk, you know, but um. <laughs> I guess what set me in motion, I'm Wendell Holland Sr.'s names. Like I'm yeah. his, I'm Wendell F. Holland the second. I am, mm -hmm. and I've always I've lived my life looking up to my dad. He was my hero, yeah. and um, he was the kind of guy, as an attorney, that um, he was able to affect a lot of people's lives and help yeah. people and do other things like that, and he would he saw what being an attorney did for him and his family and the doors it opened and the other jobs that he was able to have. And he was the kind of person that encouraged a lot of people to go to law school. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say a lot of people, pretty much anybody, you can have the most, you could be <laughs> LeBron James and he's telling you to go to law school or John Morant. He's telling Not you to go to law idea. school. So, I mean, <laughs> but you know, people have these other outlets. So yeah. at Morehouse, I was, my goal at Morehouse, I had a cousin who went to Morehouse. He graduated in an honor society, mm -hmm. Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society. It's like a, an, a very esteemed, like when you're top 10 or whatever percent of, of certain schools, you get that, mm -hmm. that achievement. And he was the reason I went to Morehouse. And when I entered Morehouse, what they do is they like, they really build you up and encourage you. It's an all black, all male school Yeah. Um, for those that don't know about it. And they have new student orientation where they tell you, they teach you about the school, its history, its purpose, the purpose of HBCUs, the um, distinguished alums from Morehouse, and they just build you up. And, and they're like, look, it's your job to, to go in here, kill it in here, and mm -hmm. go out in the world and, and be great. That's what Morehouse does. Um, so when I stepped in Morehouse with my cousin who just graduated Phi Beta Kappa, maybe five, seven years prior, yeah. I'm like, yo, that's what I want to do. I want to graduate Phi Beta Kappa. Mm -hmm. So busted my behind, worked really hard, kept my grades high. Fortunately, um, it was a blessing. I was able to achieve Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society. Um, and I was number one in the international studies department. It was, they called me the ranking scholar. It was like, I did my thing at Morehouse. Yeah. And as I'm going through Morehouse, still a creative kid, um, uh, or a creative at heart, right. I needed an outlet. So I, um, 
at Morehouse, I built like some little things for my for me and my roommate's apartment. Uh -huh. And I painted a little bit and hung some things on the wall. But then one summer I wanted to uh, I wanted to create a T-shirt that nobody had. And mm -hmm. back then um, people were doing a lot with like the puffy paints. And like there was a brand called Mesquine and they'd paint all over the shirt and they'd sell like these painted up shirts. Yeah. And that's a Philly company inspired uh -huh. by that. I created this one dope Morehouse shirt out of like puffy paints because I'm creative. Mm -hmm. I need a creative outlet. I yeah. want something unique. And um, I wore that around campus. And the college, the college store that was off campus saw me wearing it. They were like, yo, where'd you get that fire? Wow. I'm like, well, uh, I made it myself. <laughs> so then they wanted what me to flex. start making. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, that's me. That's all me. Yeah. <laughs> they wanted me to start making shirts for them. So then in college, as this guy who's locked into the books and everything, yeah. but who has always had a creative outlet, I started making t-shirts for that store. And yeah. then- the Spellman store wanted stuff. Then my high school wanted stuff. So I started like making and selling shirts and I had employees back then and I showed them how to do it. And we mm -hmm. were selling these like these Morehouse Spellman, uh, my high school, Harrington High School and yeah. other T-shirts at, at, at Morehouse. So for me, what that did was it gave me a great supplemental income. It showed me a lot about business and entrepreneurship and it was a creative outlet for me. Mm -hmm. And being that guy on the Morehouse campus, they call me the T-shirt guy. <laughs> and so being the T-shirt guy and walking around and, and a lot of people knowing me out there for my yeah. creativity. But in actuality, me staying in the books, um, I remember a friend of mine named Belton mm -hmm. and I told him, I'm like, yeah, I'm applying to law schools. These are my these are the ones I want to go to. And he looked at me like, that's not for you. What? Like, wow. yeah, you can yeah. do it. But. I see other things for you. And even back then, yeah, I was an international studies major. I had a few abroads that I'd done at Morehouse, some awesome mm -hmm. ones. And what I wanted to be was either an ambassador or a senator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, going to law school, that's a good stepping stone. It'll get me in the right direction. Right. And um, so that's like my right brain and left brain. It's They've always been right there. But then, so I applied to all these schools, get into Penn as a Philly boy. That's like the school. That's, mm -hmm. That was my top school in high school that I didn't get into. And yeah. then I get into it. I go there and I even found a creative outlet at Penn Law, um, which was, you know, I'm, I'm studying and law school. I didn't love it. It actually, something I don't talk about. It took me an extra year to graduate. Yeah. Um, I took some time off. I was depressed and all these, all these things that I don't, I don't show or talk about, but would mm -hmm. be, it would be great and motivating for people to know that. Yeah. Um, but when I was at Penn law, I took a course called visual legal advocacy where you shoot legal documentaries and, and you, uh, so I was able to do something creative. Wow. They taught me how to work a camera. They taught me how to use final cut pro um, all these things that gave me that creative outlet that I always needed. And so at Penn Law, I, I took that course. Then I took some independent studies where I was able to shoot other things. Yeah. Um, on the side, I would rent the camera out. Well, sign uh -huh. the camera out. Right. And like um, people around my neighborhood knew that I, I was shooting things and they'd like get me to shoot rat videos for them and stuff like that. <laughs> so I was always able to have this creative outlet. That might be why it took me an extra year to graduate law school. But um, I guess from, so from there, I had my, my right brain and my left brain. I got to yeah. graduate, but I also need to do something cool. I, I graduate. I um, start clerking for a judge in civil court. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm seeing all these, like power attorneys in the city and I'm mm -hmm. doing all this work for the judge. The law clerk is like the judge's brain. Pretty much you write, write opinions and do stuff. Judge signs off on things. Mm -hmm. um, then I, when that judge retired, I moved over to family court and that's when for family court to me was very, it was, it, it, it brought me to a weird place. It's family court in Philadelphia. Yeah. And you see a lot of these sad stories. Yeah. You see, parents coming in crying, fathers crying. You see the judge talking to children about how they're treated. Um, the judge having candy 
to like induce, to give the kids, to induce them to speak more and, and to yeah. actually tell their stories. Um, miserable people. Um, I was signing like protection from abuse orders and other things. And it was just, mm -hmm. it's just not a great place. And in Philadelphia, you see a lot of black folks coming in there. I see people looking like me just getting exactly. fam their families ripped apart on a daily basis. It wasn't my happiest of, of places. Um, my judge was awesome to me, but like, I just, I, I wasn't feeling good when I sat in court. Um, yeah. Fortunately, that was when I started building things for myself. That's when I, mm -hmm. I started like building my own bed. I was so happy, posted it on social media. People hit me up like, oh my gosh, it looks great. You did great, blah, blah, blah. So that's what got me into selling what I was making. Um, yeah. But it was all from this, this place of being um, in the court, but also like I had been at Morehouse and at law school, I needed that creative outlet. And it, sometimes it was painting on t-shirts. Sometimes it was filming documentaries. This time it was that childhood thing that I did built stuff and that, uh, that blossomed. So again, my yeah. long story to get to um, that, that's kind of what started beef, just me building something, posting it, friends and family liking it. And then yeah. one thing leading to another. Wow. That is like, there's so, there's so many levels to what you said. I feel like I could just sit back and like, listen to, to these stories. Cause it's so, it's like, I have to mention like some of the things that just came up for me. One is that clearly there's a pattern and I'm sure people will pick up on this, but you're, you're creating, you're creating the things that you need in your life, creating the outlets you need. So it's not like, oh, I really want to create and build things. So I'm going to go apply to find a job and I'm going to look up companies and blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. You just created that. And it's, it goes for the shirts. It goes for the yeah. furniture, all of that stuff. But then the other part that I think is so powerful, again, that I see as a pattern just in everything you said there was you're telling people about it. Like you're letting people know what you're passionate about. You're kind of like, you're being visible in that way so that people could then say, when we want you to, we want you to, to make some stuff for us or, you know, like they could spread the word or tell their friends. And so I feel like there's like a deep lesson there, but more, even more, I will say, I've never thought that I've never uh, I've considered law school barely. Um, it's not I don't think it's for me, but, you know, like you'll have like someone like your dad. Heck, I probably maybe I ran into your dad at some point. And he was like, <laughs> you should go to law school. And I was like, I don't know about that, uh, Mr. Holland, but uh, Mr. Holland senior. Uh, but, you know, I think like it's uh, it's interesting because I wouldn't have imagined that there was like filmmaking in law school and like I don't think that's necessarily a reason to go to law school and there are a lot of reasons not to but like damn I'm like okay I could see myself um sneaking into a law school course and like becoming doing that because that sounds really interesting uh but wow there's like there's so much there's so much there yeah. I actually have like another question though that I want to ask because as you talk about this journey and you know of course we'll get to like a little bit of survivor and like of course there's so much more to get to in your story but um i just think it's interesting that you went to morehouse my dad also went he went to an hbcu and was like telling me to go to an hbcu so i i uh he went where'd to he go power h u yeah so i'm in dc i went but i went to look i went to um a a PWI, primarily white institution, the George Washington University. Uh, Great I wish I probably went to to Howard, but and you know I could still go for grad school. I don't know if you just said grad school, but that's why I heard. So I'm like, damn. Well, I, I said it's a great school. GW's oh well, great school. <laughs> yeah. But Howard, uh, there's no but. Yeah. And yeah. Howard, Howard. So the cousin that I followed to Morehouse. Yeah. His his older sister. Yeah. Is the cousin that my sister followed to Howard. Okay. So so like. Yeah. Yeah. That fan, that my those cousins of mine who are doing tremendous things right now, yeah. they inspired us to both go to HBCUs. So the same love that I have for Morehouse, I have it for Howard. Yeah. And coincid um, you said your father passed on yeah. March eighth. Yeah, March eighth. Um, March eighth is coming up soon, and yeah. that's also my birthday. What? Yeah. Look at damn. Look at this. Look at. Yeah. So much, so much coming together. I don't know. Yeah. There's, there's a lot there, but I, I actually want to like, um, in the spirit of covering a lot of grounds here with mm -hmm. you today, 
I'm like curious about um, just that shift. So growing up in Philly and then going to Morehouse, um, being surrounded by black people, of course, and then you go to Penn Law, like, um, I, I, I wonder what was like, was, was there anything notable about that experience just from like the perspective of being a black man at Penn, at Penn Law? Mm -hmm. um, were there other black people there? I've actually been reading a book um, that's more, I think about like, high school experience um and it's called admission or no admissions and it's by uh kendra something and i'm blanking and i feel bad about that but she talks a lot about like um her experience as a black person again in a primarily white institution like what was that experience like for you yeah um it, different so yeah. i i grew up in a white area uh yeah a very jewish area very white area. Uh -huh. um, and, but my parents made it a point to bring me to like the black neighborhoods, put me in the black camps mm -hmm. uh, for basketball. I'm in the Sunny Hill League. That's the, the league in the city at Temple yeah. U. So uh -huh. like my dad made it a point to, to make sure that I was, I was cultured. I knew who I was. My mother's Guyanese. She made it a point for me to know my history um, and be in tune with that they they we were in the black church growing up so mm -hmm. despite where we lived um i was kind of i was in tune with my culture and who i was kind of yeah. i was still at, at at i went to Harrington high school in lower marion uh -huh. and i was one of the few black kids there you know so yeah uh i was different i was i was different then and then when i came to morehouse this all black school i didn't know what i was getting into i mm -hmm. just know that my cousin who did so well um spoke so highly about it. And he said, he's, he, he calls me beef. He was like, beef, yeah. when you go to Morehouse, you're going to yeah. see the whole spectrum of your people. And yeah. I'm like, well, I come from a great family. I killed it at sports. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm the man, you know, I'm going <laughs> to be down there and I'm the man. So then I get down there and I look over and it's Denzel's kid, JD Washington. Oh. I'm like, oh, he comes from a better family. <laughs> he comes from, he was killing it at sports. He's playing football at Morehouse right now, killing it. Now yeah. you see him uh, on like TV shows and stuff and movies. But I'm like, oh, this is what Morehouse is about. Mm -hmm. Then I got, and then I got, uh, I became friends with my buddy Gabe, who came from like, he, he came from DC. He went to Georgetown yeah. Prep. Mm -hmm. He was like brilliant at Morehouse, killing it on his LSAT. Then I'm like, so I'm seeing all these people down there that I'm just like, whoa, these people, this is greatness that I'm surrounded by. So I need to step my game up. I came here thinking I would be the man, but no, they're all the men. Like these guys mm -hmm. are next level. Then I'd see like, I'd see the, the dudes that listen to heavy metal. I'd see the dudes that are skateboarders. I'd see, I'd really see the diversity of our people at Morehouse. I'm yeah. like, you know what? The... I, I might have had a skewed perception of my own culture and my own people before mm -hmm. coming to this institution. So at Morehouse, what I was able to, to, I was able to gain a lot of confidence and just understand how diverse black people can be. And I mean, there were white people at Morehouse too. Um, yeah. A couple, you know, a small, a few right, of them. Right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, they were always like, they were super cool for, you know, for them to be in a school with all brothers, they had to be like, you know, really cool. So, um, so that was my Morehouse experience. It was an experience where I saw a lot of people that looked just like me mm -hmm. in a country that doesn't always portray such imagery in a country that doesn't exactly. always uplift black men. I mm -hmm. stepped into a school that just showed me like every, all my friends from here are going to top 10 grad schools or wall street or starting a business or doing these things. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So um, that was great for Morehouse. So I'm like, you know what? I didn't get into Penn Law when I was in high school. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't get into Penn when I was in high school. Right. I'm going to get in there out of Morehouse. Yeah. And so then I go to law school and it is different. It's different than Morehouse. Morehouse was nurturing. Law school mm -hmm. is a bunch of like you got to You do your thing and study up and yeah get out of here. And mm -hmm. um, so it was difficult for me. It was harder. I, I mentioned that I was like, I kind of had like a little depression and other things. Yeah. And, and thankfully I found my creative outlet as a one L I was in 
um, my Civ Pro pro civil procedure professor, her name is Amy Wax. Uh Um, She just Google, just Google Amy Wax pen law. She is like, she, she has been making noise by saying a lot of like, almost like white supremacist kind of, uh, or like, like things to, to insinuate that minorities don't succeed as well or don't do as yeah, well. And like, she's very controversial. So, so for me to step into a school and that is one of my first professors I'm meeting. Um, I don't know, like it, yeah. it the granted, I found some great professors that were really um, like nurturing and uplifting, but it was very different than Morehouse. And yeah. I guess my output showed that. And um, so, but it's also like, you're not going to exist in an all black world. So it's good for me to have that Morehouse education that lifted me up. That's like, yo, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. In my childhood, I said, my my parents didn't give me any limitations. So that was very affirming. And then I think that was able to just put me out in the world where in a world where I am very confident. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm very loving. I like building people up. That's all yeah. also for Morehouse. Like I want to build my brothers up. I want to motivate people um, of all races. I, 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 I love motivating people. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you're not going to live in an all black world. So mm-hmm. Penn Law kind of snapped me back to reality. Like, all right, the world is also kind of a harsh place. And you, the kid who went to a, a very white high school, a very black yeah. college, and a very white white um, law school. You're now prepared for the world because, but with with this added like a confidence yeah. that on the show it kind of showed as like a cockiness, but that's different. I don't know on yeah. the show. On the show, like I'm a competitor. I play basketball and all that stuff uh-huh. my whole life, and I know on the basketball court we talk a little bit of shit. You know, yeah. we, we we do our thing. So like. In the show, I'm like talking a little trash to probes while I'm doing something, but I thought it was more friendly. But you know, yeah. So, but anyway. yeah, well, actually, actually, like getting to that because, like, I know, like, with your story, so you were talking about being a law clerk, and then the that the judge that judge retired, right? And then okay, you... I'll I'll put a button yeah, on that. Yeah, so, put yeah, a button the, on that. <laughs> the family court judge retired. Family court um, judge retired. at that point, I was applying heavy for Survivor, applying, oh. applying, applying. Um, yeah. yeah. So it took me seven years to get on. And yeah. uh, but then I started building and I changed my look a little, grew my fro and did, I was like real <laughs> yeah. clean cut. Yeah. Um, so then I changed that look. And that's when uh, that's when they 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 received um, me and they wanted me on the show. It was like after I started my business mm-hmm. on my own within two years after applying for five years prior, I was on Survivor. Yeah. So first of all, okay, we're going to, I want to talk a little bit about that, but first, like you mentioned, okay, like, you know, it it was read as cockiness, you know, but you were, and actually I will say that like, and I, I find this even talking with my mom where sometimes she's like, you know, cause we talk, you, you have a different relationship with your parents than you do with other people. And sometimes with her, I have to say like, Oh no, I'm like really confident in this. Like, I know I've got this, like this thing I know I've got. There's so much, like, especially as a a young black queer person in this world that I could doubt about myself. And so you have to almost like aggressively take up space and be cocky, not only for other people to see that you're capable, but for you to like remind yourself of that or at least for me that's that's part of it but I want to ask like specifically because some somebody did ask me uh to ask you this is, right, let's like, hear it did you have like certain types of survivor challenges that were your favorites was it the endurance ones the obstacle oh. ones like what were the ones that you were the cockiest about let's say or the most confident about I'll, I'll put yeah it. okay yeah let's say the most yeah. confident um but yeah, that that confidence, I think it could be a defense mechanism for yeah. people that, that look like totally. us. And mm-hmm. yeah, so I, th- I think it's uh, in a world where you are told that you can't do things, you better hold your ha- head high and do things, you know? Mm-hmm. And for for um, for me, with Sur- I made it on Survive. Like I got on this show that I've been applying for years. Yeah. You can't tell me nothing. I'm going to be uh-huh. out there and I'm going to be happy. And I'm going to be yelling at probes and I'm going to be running around and I'm going to be building a bunch of stuff. You can't like, I made it on Survivor. So yeah. 
that so my first season I wanted to like <laughs> I had that in me but I wanted I was like I got to win this thing so when certain people would say certain things to right. microaggressions and whatnot exactly I'd be like Laurel be like yo Wendell I can't believe you said that to me I'd be like Laurel you and I are going to sit here at the end so yeah let's not react right now that was kind of like the uh like the Obama philosophy like mm. He got hit with so much stuff, yeah. But he couldn't. He didn't respond. He didn't. I, the State of the Union was last night. I remember when that guy screamed out, "You lied to him at the State of the Union." Yeah. I was looking in the mirror, thinking about that just last night, and I'm like, uh, "What face would I have made at that guy? Like, or what would I have done to that guy at that moment?" Yeah. Obama didn't do it. He looked at him and he kept it moving. So mm -hmm. on on Ghost Island, that that's what I want. I wanted to like, just. I, if I hear anything, I wouldn't react unless I had to. Um, and I try to just keep it all very, like, very, very calm and collect. And it served me very well out there. Mm -hmm. and when there's that war, I wanted to loosen up a little bit. Okay. I, I was a little more loose. I had a little yeah. more fun. It was portrayed a little differently. But to answer the question and put a button on this, yeah. Um, my favorite challenges are the ones where we're doing a lot of stuff. We start in the water, we're swimming, we grab a sandbag, we do this, we do that. All the obstacles that yeah. end with a puzzle. Okay. That's what yeah. I love. So, cause, cause the way I see it, I'm going to beat y'all at the obstacles and I'm going to beat y'all at the puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but it all, it, it levels the yeah. playing field. So like, I, I, I'd like to, I'd probably, um, on ghost Island, I was able to get to the puzzle first or within the top couple and mm -hmm. i was able to really like i love puzzles i'm good at puzzles on the lsat there was the logic game section which is like it's almost like a puzzle section um the things i build i have a, a headboard that i call the patchwork style headboard it's yeah. a million scrap pieces of wood just pieced together like a puzzle um so i i love puzzles so it's something that i'm pretty good at and um so that's the challenge that i love Ooh, yeah, but answer. I mean, even even more like kind of to to widen out again um, to like the maybe like the broader um, the broader experience implications of of, you know, you won, you're a winner. We'll make sure that that's clear in case anyone didn't know. Um, but, you know, I being a black winner, because there are only so only so many, unfortunately, um, do you feel like that put you in a position where like you had to be an advocate or a voice for black people? Like, how was that? Um, well, yeah. How was that experience different in, in short, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, in short, um, in short, Well, you can go on if you want yeah. forever about it too, but I'm sure there's like, I realize it's a, like a, this, that could be its own podcast. And I'm sure I know it, it, there have been, yeah. thankfully there have been a, a handful of podcasts that have talked a little bit about that, but like, yeah, what, what was that experience like? And did it put you in an advocacy position? And then also like, how did that feel for you? Um, just kind of navigating that experience as a, black winner who i know a lot of people um sought to invalidate and for yeah. for whatever reasons you know that's yeah yeah so first and foremost right when we got off the island me dom and laurel mm -hmm. we were super tight on the island we were sure that um dom and i tied laurel had to break the tie she had to break yeah. the tie our mm -hmm. ally our sister out there and we had this eight month span before this, the season even started or however long it was before yeah. it even aired. Right. So we knew what happened. We knew a, a black dude from Philly and a white dude from long Island tied mm -hmm. at the end of survivor. Dom and I, during that eight month span, we were super cool. We'd hang out. We go to um, Brooklyn Nets games with Chris. Yeah. Noble. We do all we, you know, and we're still this tight. Yeah. Um, so, but we knew the, the larger implications or how that would be viewed. And Dom and I made it a point, like there's nothing that will break our friendship that can be portrayed or come out or anything mm -hmm. through the season or after the tie. We, we communicated that to each other. And we said, like, we know that 
This was uh, 2018. This is during Trump's presidency. America's a little funny right now, a lot funny and polarized. We won't allow what happened on this island to separate us, to break us apart as friends. And it's even, it's even um, more powerful that we make sure people see that. Me, a black man, him, a white man, right. being best friends on this show, but also outside of the show, despite people trying to say whatever. Laurel voted for you because you're black or this, that. Don played a better game. He was more strategic. He dragged whatever they say and would say, Dom and I would find ways to uh, defend the other person. I defend Dom. He defend me. We defend Laurel. And she yeah. might have gotten more flack than any of us. Oh, totally. Um, yeah. So coming coming out of that season, I knew that I had to be very smart with my words and how I, um, I mean, but at the end of the day, we both played tremendous games and it showed throughout the votes. And that that is what it is. Mm -hmm. We tied. We yeah. and we were we were we were locked in together. But ultimately, I got the edge at the end and I won. And that changed that changed things for me. And I started getting a lot more press. And that's when the HGTV shows and things came to me. And I just, I thought that I did a good job representing who I was on Ghost Island. And I thought that they did a good job portraying it. And that's, that's who I think when people meet me in real life, which is, um, that's been a good thing from Ghost Island through Winners at War. So Winners at War, I got a lot of flack, but I met a lot of people between Ghost Island and Winners at War. I had watch parties. I wanted to be everywhere. And when people meet me in real life, I think they get the Ghost Island Wendell. And I think um, that's what helped on Winners at War when the people that don't know me were saying a lot of stuff right. about me. Then I'd see the people that I have met defending me. So it, um, I, I just try to be the same person. I just try to be me when I meet people. I love meeting Survivor fans. And um, the people that don't know me or haven't met me, they might have their perceptions of me because of how I was portrayed on uh, Winners at War. But I just encourage them to to dig a little deeper and maybe listen to podcast interviews or maybe come to one of my parties and meet me in real life and they might change their opinion. Yeah. And then have you found yourself like in, in a position where you are? Um, I mean, because I think especially maybe less so when your season was happening or when your first season was happening, but more, you know, especially after Winners at War, because we saw um, just the Survivor Diversity campaign come around and the Black Survivor Alliance and just this big push. And of course, we thankfully saw um, CBS's a CBS Viacom's diversity commitment when it comes to 50% um, BIPOC representation. So that's powerful. But have you found yourself just considering the fact that you were like, or you are really one of the only black winners, like in an advocacy position or, and kind of how has that been speaking to the experience of being a black person out on that Island? Yeah. So um, I, I consider myself an ambassador for the show. And I know that I'm the last black winner and my favorite winner before me was Jeremy Collins. Well, wait a minute. And not the, not the, not the last one, but the late, the last one. I know what you mean. Cause we're going to have wait, 10, we're going to have a, everyone else who's going to win oh, from here on is going to be black. We'll talk about that too. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So the latest, the latest black winner, there will yeah. be, there will be more many black winners <laughs> and there will be many women winners. Exactly. Going forward. Yeah. Um, so but as the latest, yeah. um, I, I I consider myself kind of like a big bro to people. And uh, I try to like people come off the show with, with different perspectives. And I understand that my first time I came off the show with a skewed perception because I was a winner. And from my experience out there, it's on level 1,000. My portrayal on my winning season, it's on level a thousand. So I came off on this on this high that only, you know, the 40, 41 people have, have been able to achieve out of the hundreds of people that have played. So I mm -hmm. recognize that my first experience is not the normal experience. But then my second experience really brought me to earth and, and showed me that this is how some people feel on this show. And with that, um, I was able to like 
first of all, I got super depressed during those those few episodes and whatnot. Lower than I've ever been from my the comments that I got online. Um, I have a 13 minute long video still on my phone wow. of me blocking people, Survivor yeah. fans, from the negative stuff that they said on my social media. Um, 13 minutes long, and I keep it so I can remember where I was. And I, I'd show it. To, I'll show it to you the next time I, show, I see you. But um, the the worst of comments telling me to kill myself, racial slurs, all these things in my in my in my comments. And so that experience. I had this super high experience and this super low experience. And I told myself, I'm done with Survivor. Um, I recall people, I didn't know why I was portrayed that way. Right now, I'm, right. I'm chalking it up to like, all right, they needed a, a funny uh, or they needed a cute storyline. Wendell and Michelle used to date and we're going to make it about her hating him and getting whatever. Right. Um, yeah. They knew that wasn't what was going on on the island. But for some reason, they chose me, the one of two black people on the island, the newest black winner, a, a, the one of the latest two winners. It was just me and Nick, and then it was season forty that were yeah. that was on the island, and they and they buried me. And so bec because I was so depressed and upset and angry, I was like, I'm done with Survivor. I'm not. I'm done. I'm not gonna post. I'm going to walk away from this community. And um, that's one way that you can respond to things. And in my case, I thought it was justified. I had HGTV opportunities for huge one huge show that I turned down because I'm loyal and I wanted to go back on Survivor 40. So I wow. said no to that show and I went on Survivor 40. And they knew that. So I was so low. And so, yeah, you can walk away. But then there was kind of like this magnitude of this moment. It was 2020, the George Floyd, Black Lives Matter movement. And there's something that I learned from my father. It's about harnessing the moment or, or striking at a certain time. And right. these groups started getting together. These black groups started getting together and saying, all right, we need to, we need to make something happen right now. Like while the world is watching, now is the time that things can change. So with the Soul Survivor Alliance, I was like, you know what? I would I have that experience where I felt like I was unfairly portrayed. Now I have an experience that I know a lot of other black players have had and they've walked away from Survivor. But now I'm going to use that and instead of walking away, I'm going to try to change Survivor. So there were like eight of us, 10 of us, and we had a Zoom with Probst and a, a, a lot of other higher ups. Jatia had this uh, change.org petition that we were blasting. Um, yeah, I and, remember that. Yeah, and we, we, it, that was the time to shake things up and say, you know what? This thing harmed me. I felt like I was done wrong, but I'm going to use all of that, whatever it is inside of me, and try to change this thing and make it better for those that come after me. So... After that diversity initiative, um, we had this Zoom with Probst. I told him exactly what I just communicated, how low I was. The other folks told them about their experiences. Bryce spoke about being the first open, openly gay black male on the show. Yeah. He was the third boot. Bryce is killing it right now. You know, like imagine if they were to if, imagine if Survivor was ready for Bryce at that time. I don't think Survivor America was ready for that character at that time. If that fool was on the show, he'd kill it today. Um, yeah. Everyone, everyone, Jatia and her portrayal, this yeah. brilliant woman, she they got her looking crazy. I mean, she did some. Look, some okay, boy, oh, that. look, I'm just going to say, look, the rice is in the fire, whatever. I mean, it was a choice. It was a choice. But I mean, like, you know, the fact that someone who's that brilliant, not to interrupt you, but the fact that someone who's that brilliant could then be simplified down to like one moment or one memory or being like, oh, this is the crazy person, quote unquote. 
that's not right. Come on. Not give, right. You have to give no. these people. And like you and even what you're speaking to with winners at war also speaks to that. Um, and it but it's especially harmful. I'm not saying it comes from like a sinister place necessarily. But I mean, it is because I, I don't think that's necessarily it. I just think it's harmful when we think about the implications of like portraying a black person that way, because that sticks to us, you know, and it's sad because you know, I could go throw some rice in a fire and I, and then that erases, that might erase everything else I've done in people's yeah. eyes. Right. Or do like one thing that's a little bit off. And then that's what people define you by rather than, you know, seeing you fully for your successes, your failures, the positives and the negatives. So there's a lot there. And if I may, yeah. Um, to that point, yeah. Like there, it could just be a blind spot of theirs. And I started trying to understand that when it's a bunch right. of, uh, when the producers is like, like the white boys club, maybe it's a little, maybe it's a, maybe telling a black man's story or a black woman's story or a gay man's story. Maybe that is one of their blind spots. And so um, we asked to kind of change that around too a little bit so that there are more black faces or black psychologists or black people in, in casting exactly. or a black executive producer, we, at the very least, then, then that can, um, those people might be able to help tell our stories a little bit or stray from certain tropes or as a castaway, like in my position on this Island, not seeing any black faces um, behind the camera. Well, there were some of the camera crews were, were black dudes, but mm -hmm. like not seeing some of the producers or like these storytellers, there's something that it does to you. And some people can rise above it, but it, it's, it's better at least seeing someone that looks like you that, that is out there um, when you're in this crazy game that is like it's a lot it's all all the survivors it's their goals it's their dreams they wanted to be out there so long so let's again let's free people from anything that can hinder them just going out there and playing their game and so seeing um i think seeing a more diverse cast and also having a more diverse behind the scenes um crew will really help more people just go out there and play their games. When you were talking a lot about representation, you're talking you're talking about kind of your experiences as a black survivor player winner. Um, but I actually want to ask you about um, uh, one of my favorite winners, one of my favorite black winners. And no, I'm not talking about Jeremy Collins. And maybe I'm using the term winner loosely. But Bryce Isaiah, um, <laughs> I want to kind of bring him up because. Yes you know, uh, an icon. I, I always, I will like any chance I get, I always say to Bryson, like you paved the way for me to like be on RHAP where I have like two show, two shows, two shows right now between pod friends and the wrestling we wrap up. And like, he, he's so iconic. Um, and I love him so much, but I want to kind of ask you, um, even based on that, especially like from my pers well, number one, why do you put up with Bryce is the first question. Great question. Still trying so to figure that let's, out. Let's start there. Uh, why do you put up with Bryce? Okay. So, <laughs> man, where do I even start with Bryce? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, why do I, I'll answer your question. Why do I put up with him? Because uh -huh. he is by far the funniest person I know. He mm -hmm. is hilarious. He's, I equate walking around with Bryce to walking around with a real life cartoon character because <laughs> he's he's larger than life the things that come out of his mouth are ridiculous um i learned so much from him yeah. um i've always had gay friends mm -hmm. always even when i didn't know they were gay it like my middle school best friend um when i moved school districts and he moved school districts we were best friends he was a gay guy. Um, my childhood best friend, I told you I went to like summer camp. Yeah. Like he was a gay guy. I've always at Morehouse, it's an all male school. There's a lot of gay men there. Mm -hmm. um, I've always had friends and I've been comfortable around people of all persuasions, but you know, gay guys. And 
Bryce, I watched him on Survivor, and this was when I was a Survivor fan. I'm like, this guy is a little weird. Um, I don't know if I knew he was a Philly guy, but then fast forward to my season, and yeah. I think he hit me up on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I don't even use Facebook. I don't yeah. use Facebook Messenger. He hit me up like, yo, let, let's link up. Ultimately, we linked up, and um, ever since we've been like literal, like best friends, like brothers. And a crazy story is, oh, wait um, a minute. I met him well before Survivor, and what? I have I have someone in my family that uh, suffers a, a mental illness, yeah. and that person called me and needed like that person was institutionalized. Yeah. They called me. They needed like cigarettes and some sandwiches or something. And mm -hmm. I went to the place, which is like, you know, a half hour from here. And when mm -hmm. I walked in, this is like, this is like 10 years ago, 15, 12 years ago. When I walked in, someone, a gay black dude checked me in at this mental institution. And I went in and I saw the person, I gave them what they needed. I gave them hugs and love and I left. And then like, after bonding with Bryce, becoming great friends with him, he was like, Wendell, do you know that I met you before? I was like, what are you talking about? He said, you came in to visit that person, and I was the guy working the door in there. He said, I never forget a face, and I know it was you. And I, when he said that, I was like, I do remember that person there. And then he Life brought us back around and together. Wow. And um, sadly, uh, one of his brothers, his name is Bevan, yeah. he passed away. Right. And I never had a brother. I had lots of close friends. But now Bryce is like the closest thing to a brother that I have. And I, I think I kind of like stepped into that position as his, his big bro. So like, it's crazy how life brought us together a couple times. But right now, I... I like, I love watching him just thrive, live his authentic self, use his powerful voice, um, be hilarious, be ridiculous, say the most ridiculous things, <laughs> have me speaking like I've never spoke before. Yeah. Um, the language I now know, I guess it's like, I, I, can com I can communicate in his language with him or with like, any gay dude I see, I could turn it on and I'll let, mm -hmm. I'll let people know. Like <laughs> he, he, he brought, there, there are these words that he says that I've now learned mean different things in the gay community. And like, like, what? <laughs> like have you heard of, have you heard of cruising? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. What else? <laughs> like, have you heard of the trade? Words. Yeah. Yeah. No, Bryce has talked a lot about trade on. All um, right. Have you heard pilots? about this one? He's not going to like, have you heard about painting? I can imagine. We'll talk about that later. Anyway, yeah. I, <laughs> I was like, I yeah, don't know. I you said like the uh, TV MA rating to this podcast. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Bryce has no. yeah. like this lingo that I had no idea about. And also he taught me like, for example, when I was first getting to know Bryce and who he is yeah. as a gay black man in this uh -huh. country and just how, who he is, right? I went to uh, like, I did something for like one of these show appearances where I met Honey Davenport. You know Honey Davenport? Yeah, yeah, uh, from, right. yeah, for, uh, wait, Honey Davenport, RuPaul, from RuPaul's, Dra yeah, RuPaul's, from Drag, RuPaul's Drag, Race? Drag Race, right? Yeah. And I'm like, very comfortable around gay people. So I was like, Honey Davenport over there looking like a snack. <laughs> <laughs> I said something like that. To, to, and then she looked at me and said something like, like, like don't try it or something like that i'm oh. like oh maybe maybe i should but but then i like snapped a photo with her i sent it to yeah. bryce i'm like yo da, da, da. i just I've, I've been able to learn so much about that yeah. like just because he's just because he's a gay guy he's not attracted to like any other kind of gay person it's a certain he has a type and mm. i guess this this other kind of like i've been able to learn so much about that lgbtq um community to where I have like ally flags and other things just to like, I just, I just, I just want to show acceptance and yeah. people see me and Bryce and they're like, what is this friend? Like what brings mm -hmm. you two together? 
Um, and because especially in the black community, they're even to this day, there's still homophobia and other yeah. things. And I think our friendship and I, I actually I know it. It's yeah. shown people just like that those friendships can exist. And yeah. I think I just I think it I think it portrays the right thing, but it's also it's from a genuine place. I love the guy to death. He's my brother, and um, I s speak to him every single day. I see him yeah. at least once a week. So yeah, it's a it's a beautiful friendship. Yeah, and I'll even say so. Uh, texting with Bryce uh, before this one, he you know one thing he mentioned to me just to kind of pass on to you is. And, and, you know, he's talked, this is no surprise, I'm sure, because he's he's talked about this so many times, but he just mentioned how much he appreciates your friendship and your brotherhood. And, um, and you know, I know that you you talked about how much you've grown and learned through through him, but, like, there's also the other side of that, everything that he's grown and learned from just being your close friend and overcoming a lot of phobias. I know Bryce talks about this a lot on the Purple Pants podcast, but, like, phobia phobias that um, many of us like black queer people might have of like black straight men. And you, we taught, we could talk, go into like homophobia in the black community in the, and in any, in a lot of communities, but specifically in the black community um, in this context. And so there's a lot there, but I, I kind of want to ask like maybe uh, to like button up the, the, the Bryce love a little bit. Um, there's so much that people could learn from your friendship and, you know, it's not all the time that we see like, straight black men and like um queer black men like as friends like what do you think what do you think people are missing and like what are some of the barriers that you see to like more friendships like that is there yeah. is there anything that you've kind of like picked up on in terms of of that yeah um sometimes first of all straight men need to understand that like all gay guys aren't trying to hit on you or get with you yeah. or anything like that. And, yeah. and I guess that, I guess that is, um, that's, that's one maybe barrier. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess th with this, this ultra hyper masculinity in the black community where people think that if they're seen with a gay person, then mm -hmm. people might view them as a gay person. There's that also. Um, these are things that just Bryce and I being friends, the, 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 the way we are friends, we just try to live. We try to dispel those false right. thoughts based on just how we live and express our friendship to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I think Bryce has gotten messages about it. Uh, just saying like, Hey, um, I appreciate you guys' friendship. I know I've gotten messages about it and but yeah, there there are those those things in the black community that kind of that kind of you know I don't know. And it, there's just there there's a lot in the community that doesn't. It's it's this hyper masculinity that kind of yeah. just that kind of gets in the way. And I think that the country's going in a direction where uh, yeah, where a, a better direction where there there can be more friendships. Yeah, and because. Like I said, I've learned so much from Bryce, maybe more than he's learned from me. I know I know that I help him out and I know that um, I try to amplify his voice. But man, the, the things I've learned from him on a daily basis and even regarding like compassion and just yeah. and, and, and understanding people more and listening, being a better listener, um, because on a daily basis, I'm trying to understand more about Bryce. And understand where he's coming from because our the way we grew up was different. So then the things that I learned from my best friend Bryce, yeah, yeah. I learned that people come with different baggage might not be the, the right word, but people right. people like, when they meet you, yeah. their paths brought you there, but you don't know what happened in that path that might inform different decisions of them of, of theirs going forward. So mm -hmm. if I say or do something around Bryce and he clams up. And he doesn't talk to me for two days. In my head, I'm like, why is this fool not talking to me? Like, yeah. he, communicate, talk to me. What's up? What's wrong? Yeah. He might, whatever whatever his path brought him to where he is, might make him respond to someone like me by clamming up now. Mm -hmm. So then I, yeah, there's just so much. There's There's a lot about people that I learned from just from Bryce. 
Yeah, and I think it's 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 uh it's powerful too that even just like through the Purple Pants podcast. Number one, one thing I'll say is that I love whenever Bryce uh jokingly lovingly drags you because Always. I remember like the the first the first time I met you, which was completely coincidental, running to you running into you on the corner of 21st and K here in DC. Yes. When I had no clue that you would be like putting up posters at the mm -hmm. the bar, the uh, proper 21K, I believe where um bryce one presents was that day like i even remember i don't know what i said but i remember i was like oh yeah it's wendell okay hey, hey hi wendell oh hey uh but oh bryce, bryce! Yeah. um so that i i love that for you guys too and i love like the fact that it's on all of your friendship is out there for people to like keep up with and learn from and bryce's voice is out there like through the purple pants podcast of course but kind of like shifting more to like where you are now, obviously, you know, Purple Pants Podcast, Beave Unlimited, there's HGTV. There's so much that you're up to now. I have to give a shout out there. You were on Survivor Philly, which was iconic. I think maybe that's your most popular appearance. Probably. Shout out to Alex Gardner. But I kind of want to like get to something, um, you know, kind of like uh, wrapping up your story because we could probably be here for hours, like talking through the different elements of it. But you know, something that I've seen in your story is just like this drive and this determination and like never settling for less or for not being capable. Um, like, do you have advice for people who are hearing from you on these things? Because you're sharing like you're sharing the dedication you have. You're sharing um, the learning that you've done, the ways that you've grown. Um, like, do you have advice for people who want to kind of like bring that same energy into their world into their lives of like i'm unstoppable which is like yeah. a lot of what i think you kind of have not only taught what your words say but like you just at, looking at you like damn wendell's a yeah. great example of someone who can't be stopped and i could i i more of us want that energy yeah i like i said with winning survivor and being like mm -hmm. one of this this small class of winners like and and that kind of skewing my first perception of survivor yeah. oh survivors all great they're only you know like i recognize that i'm in kind of a privileged privileged position first i recognize that you know i came from a great family um i still have two parents mm -hmm. i went to great schools i was able to live my dream on survivor and um like so I I might have a skewed perception of the world even that mm -hmm. that if there's something that you see, if you stick to it, like if you keep on pushing the right buttons, if you have a goal, you can you can achieve it, but you got to stick to it. Mm -hmm. um, I have like 100 books on my bookshelf that that give those kinds of it, those kinds of words and that kind of advice. That's yeah. like if if you stick to something. Um, there, are, there are ways to do it by like being laser focused on a goal and do it. there's a book called the one thing where it's like you pick mm -hmm. one thing and you get to that for that, that one thing that you want to do in a year. How do you do it? What gets you there in six months or what gets you there in one month? What gets you there in one, one week and start with that one week and then get to that one month and get, then get to that six months. Like I, I've surrounded myself with things that tell me like reinforcers that say, you know what? These are how you accomplish your goals, but also I've lived a life that has kind of shown me that if you have that goal, even if you don't accomplish it at first, I didn't get into Penn undergrad, you know? Yeah. I did my thing at Morehouse. I was able to get into Penn Law. I didn't get on Survivor my first 10 times. Mm -hmm. I drove, I lived in LA for a small amount of time. I drove like two hours out to go to a live casting call. And I thought yeah. I killed it. I didn't get on back then. Um, I put on, I, I, on YouTube is my video of me applying when I'm sitting in the judge's chair uh, in the, in the courtroom. I got yeah. a low cut. I got a, a tie on and I'm saying like, you know, I didn't get on then, but I didn't give up. And so I try to, I just, I try to tell people to have a goal and not give up on that goal. Um, and yeah. the people coming off the show, and the people going on the show, I try to tell them, no matter how you're portrayed on the show, 
It's what you want. Whatever you want to create after that show is what you can do. And I use Bryce as an example. I use myself as an example. Some people come off and they're upset about their portrayal and, and they might be rightfully so, but right, right. what I say is it doesn't matter how you were portrayed. It, what matters is your, how you, how you interact with people on a daily basis, the people that meet you that will ultimately inevitably recognize you on the street. They become ambassadors of yours. They become people that speak praises of you. So be friendly to them. And after coming off of the show, think about whatever you want to do and have that as your goal and do it. And that's what I, fortunately, that's yeah. what I've been blessed to be able to do with a lot of luck. Um, mm -hmm. But like getting on HGTV, my goodness, as a builder, that's what you, as someone that builds and designs furniture, that's, of course, that's what I wanted to do. And of course, I went on Ghost Island wanting to build everything I could on that island. So maybe someone would <laughs> right. see me out there. And that's what happened. But I have so. to ask, like, what is it that you want to like, you're talking about building. There's so much there. We're kind of getting to the end. I have a couple more, like, two more questions. One yeah. of them though is like, what is it that you want to manifest in the world? We're talking about goals, Wendell. So we're here. The people <laughs> are listening. What is like, what, what's your next big goal? Cause you've crushed a lot of those goals that you've had. Like, yeah. what's next on your journey or what do you want to like i'm almost picturing like some like stars and some magical i wish I, i'm not going to add sound effects but like some magical sound effects in there like what what is it what's coming yeah. up next what do you want to come up next for you i should say all right uh, this i appreciate that question i'm a Speak manifester it into existence. i'm a i'm yeah. a journaler I, oh. I do the i i put things i try to put things out into the universe and I've said this on, I said I wanted to be on HGTV for a very long time. And I've said what I'm going to say next many times. I want to be one of their guys. I want to be one of their faces. I've been, mm -hmm. uh, the last show we shot was my sixth show with them since the pandemic. Um, a lot of them have been like little appearances, little co-hosts for one, right. one hour, one hour. Hot Mess House, I had a whole season. Uh, mm -hmm. that was my first whole season and that was a blessing. Yeah. I really, really, all the execs, all the production company, everyone that has ever production companies, anyone in the HGTV world that has met me knows that like, I love, I love that network and I want to be one of their go-to guys. So what, whatever that means, I mean, right now, like I said, they've called me six times now and that's great. But I see some real faces that are very recognizable on that network. I want to be one of their real faces. And um, one other thing, I've been recognized one single time from HGTV. One mm. time. I'm recognized a lot for Survivor. Yeah. But I want, I want to be one of their guys to where I can be recognized for HGTV. Like, oh my gosh, you're that guy from that show on HGTV look yeah. i i hope that for you because like the thing is if i i bet if i went on twitter now and searched for gif of you dancing on hgtv like maybe that's not in twitter's go-to's but that was a moment and those i don't know i don't know if you've if it was more more than one time but i like i like the the spice the energy that you bring i feel like hgtv needs more of it all i'm asking though is like if you need anyone to like shine your shoes on the show or like um you know maybe you need like i don't know i don't know like i'm just saying i'm here you could call me you hit me up uh but you know one last question i really want to ask is just about your story and kind of like wrapping it up is like if your life were a book or a documentary Wendell, what would the title be and why? Okay. I like that question a lot. Um, I What I like to do, what I really, really like to do is take people that are friends of mine um, and just give them a little more encouragement or like mm -hmm. say something that kind of gets them, gets them going. I like trying to motivate. I like trying to motivate people. And so I think if I were to have a book um and i've like i've like written little chapters here and there i i've written i have Ooh. an outline of if i were to have written a book on myself i have like an Ooh. outline 
I also have a children's book that I wrote in my head on Winners at War. Wow. Then I transcribed it when I got off the show. So I have that also, which I'd love to get out there. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's a pretty dope book about like many cultures coming together to achieve something great. So it, we'll, we'll but, get that out there sooner or later. We'll get no, it out there. So, sooner. Yeah. Sooner. Yeah. But um, if I if I had a book that I could publish about my life, it would be it would it would be motivational and I'd probably call it planting seeds because I like to try to like plant motivational seeds in people that gets them to do great things. And um, yeah. And like re even regarding the diversity initiative, I before before the CBS diversity initiative, there'd be a small handful of black folks um, and BIPOC folks coming coming out. There'd be small classes coming out every season, right? One or two people here and there. Right. I was able to meet the cookout at Hearts of Reality. And mm -hmm. I'm like, this is beautiful. And this is one season. And if I can just, if I could do something little in these people that encourages them to then do something little in the next class or the next classes of mm -hmm. Survivor, BIPOC, and Big Brother BIPOC, then man, like if if we all just plant these little seeds in these people, who knows what can who knows what can blossom? So my book would be entitled Planting Seeds, and it would be motivational and about just the the effect that inspiring one or two people could do to to many more people via some sort of butterfly effect. Damn, this is all so deep. And you know what? I think like one thing I'm excited about. I can't I, like I'm not even going to try to like build on that, add to that. That's so you've given us so much in this time when and I just want to thank you for this, Wendell. Um, and you know what? The good news is people are hearing you now. They could meet you at Bryson when presents, yep. which is a great time. Um, meet not only connecting with like you and Bryce and other survivor players and some other people in this reality TV world, but also meeting other fans, meeting some podcasters. I will probably be there. Uh, if you don't want to meet me, well, then, like, um, you can avoid <laughs> me. But, like, uh, it's all good. You know, all love. Um, but, you know, I think, like, you are creating such a space for yourself in this world and in, the com in not only this survivor-adjacent community, but just, like, carving out a space that other people don't occupy. And I think that that's really powerful and motivational. And so... I don't know. I just want to kind of give you the space for any final words to close us out. Um, well, yeah. thank you very, very much for having me on. Like I said, mm -hmm. I, I view um, this as a safe space. Yeah. I think that ha your voice is a powerful voice, um, as is Bryce's. And mm -hmm. there's there's something to you and, and this podcast. So thank you for having me on. Um, can't wait to see you again soon. Yeah. And um, Bryce and One presents, uh, what is it? The 42 premiere mm -hmm. is uh, next week, but also we will be coming to DC this season. We uh, will be uh, maybe right, going right, elsewhere, right, maybe right, going to the right. Midwest, maybe going to the left coast. Whoa. So uh, we got a lot coming this season. We have mm -hmm. big plans. And um, I just appreciate you giving me the time to just ramble on for so long. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to this week's episode, the season finale of Pod Friends. Again, I would encourage you to follow Pod Friends at Hey Pod Friends. Subscribe to Pod Friends. Rob has a website.com slash Pod Friends feed. There are other links in the description for where you can become a patron, where you can email me, all the things. It's all there. So check out those show notes. And again, just big thanks to Rob's sister, Nino, for um, the opportunity. Thank you to Scott St. Pierre, Hannah Lidsky, Sam Moore, Tricky Rice, Chelsea Lester, just the whole team at RHAP who's making this possible. And if you want to get in touch um, with me, you can email me podfriends at robhiswebsite.com. But you're all amazing. So thankful for you. And um, one last time for this first season, I just want to thank you for being a pod friend.